What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business, like the founders of P90X, Atari, Baby Einstein. Uh, you know, For example, Julie Clark, founder of Baby Einstein, grew her business to $20 million in five years, but we also talked about beating cancer, how she beat cancer twice. Um, Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, where entrepreneurs of six, seven, and eight-figure businesses come together live and in person every few months to solve their biggest business challenges and leave with lifelong friendships. Check out Rise25.com. It's run by myself and co-founder John Corcoran, and it's application only. Today, I'm very excited um, to have PJ, who seems so calm, so collected, and you're going to you know, understand why that is strange to me in a second. But PJ Jonas is founder of Goat Milk Stuff, which she built in her kitchen into a multi-million dollar business. Her goat milk products business has been featured on the Today Show, The Doctors, and Oprah Magazine. And the reason I am flabbergasted that she seems so calm, she not only does that, but she runs a farm and is mother of eight children. PJ, thanks for joining me. Thanks so much for having me, Jeremy. That is wild. That is yeah. wild. It's my life. <laughs> I mean, tell me about the youngest person. It's the youngest person rule. Yeah. So I decided way back at the beginning when I first started having children that they were all going to work, that I was not going to be the one, the kind of mom who did everything for them and, and uh, made their life super easy so that when they became adults, they didn't know what to do. So I decided that I was going to implement what I call the youngest person rule. Yeah. And that means that the youngest person in the family capable of doing a job is the one that does it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, my, my kids started doing laundry when they were five, six, you know, putting mm-hmm. away dishes when they were two, three, that kind of thing. And what's happened over the years is as the children grow up, they teach their younger sibling how to do their job and then they pass it down to them. And it's that incentive to teach them. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Yeah. You know, and the younger one thinks it's really cool for a while <laughs> that they get to do a new job. You know, it's that classic Tom Sawyer kind of principle. Like, yeah, this is fun. You can do this. You, know? right. you can paint the fence. Exactly. exactly. So what is what would blow people's minds and how young one of your kids did a task that most people would be like, wow, a three-year-old or four-year-old or five-year-old did that? Yeah, well, I the recent example, uh, we just split our farm store. We create, we uh, moved it into two separate buildings, and um, we had a tour going through. And my my daughter, who is now um, ten, Indigo, came in, and she was like, "Yeah, uh, sorry, I'm late. I was busy programming the cash register." <laughs> and they were all like, "You were what? You know, how did you figure that out?" She's like, "Well, you know, it took a while, but I managed to get it. It's all set up." So youngest, how old's the youngest now and how old's the oldest? Right now they're age 9 to 19. So they're all about a year and a half apart. They're all singles. I didn't have any multiples. So it's all, you know, that's about it right now. That is wild. And so, and you homeschool though. I do. I do homeschool. So I didn't even throw that in the intro. So yeah. how do you, what's a day look like? Tell me what's a day look like for you. Well, I know all of them are different, but, but like yeah, typically yeah. when do you wake up? Like walk me through like yesterday. Okay, so a lot of it depends on the season we're in. So right now we're in the holiday season. Yep. Uh, so, you know, the, the retail side of our business is hopping. So a lot of the focus gets put on there. Yep. And so we typically get up at 6 a.m. Uh, some of my boys get up earlier. They get up at 5 because they have to go out and do the morning milking. So they'll be up. You know, we have we have a family breakfast. We have a morning meeting. We all get together so we can go over the day, what's important, what everybody needs to How do. How do you feed Ten people. I mean, what do you have for breakfast? They eat so much food. I mean, do you go through three loaves of bread per meal? I mean, what, what's, yeah. what's breakfast look like? Well, my, my oldest son, who's 18, he makes breakfast. Okay, what uh, does he make? And so it, he, it's just different each and every day. So uh, yesterday... And well, yesterday and today, he um, made uh, bagels from scratch. <laughs> so he It's not he made, hard enough. Let's make them from yeah, scratch. Yeah, he made sourdough bagels. So we had that with goat cheese. So that was yesterday and today. But, you know, French toast. I mean, we, we go through like two or three dozen eggs a day. 
that kind of thing. You know, if they make pancakes, I mean, it's just we have multiple griddles going, you know, and it's just to keep it going, to keep everybody kind of fed. But it's a lot of food. That's a, that's a major, major task around here is keeping everybody fed. And so, we, we eat healthy, so it's, you know, it's a lot of cutting vegetables and yeah, you know, very little frozen stuff around here. So you're They're waking up right at now. 6. Yeah. Is it, uh, breakfast, the oldest, you know, makes breakfast. Then what happens after that? So then everybody kind of goes off to their jobs. Okay. Um, everybody has a job. All the children get a right. salary. So um, they have kind of, you know, an outline of what they're they're mainly right. responsible for. But because it's a small business and a farm, there's always changes. You know, someone that's what we discuss at the family meeting, you yeah. know, who needs help today? Um, since we're in the retail season, we're, we're making a lot of extra soap because we do a lot of fundraisers during this time of year. So mm. they may need help with unmolding and cutting that kind of thing. Right. But everybody kind of goes off. And does their chores. Some go to the barn, some go to the soap room. You know, I tend to go to the office and, and do uh, website stuff and, and um, you know, kind of the overhead, yeah. pay, all that kind of stuff. And then we get back together at lunch. So my 12-year-old is responsible for lunch. He's got to get lunch on the table. What did he make yesterday? Um, so yesterday, he, typically he does leftovers. So typically he um, goes How are to the there bar- leftovers with eight, with 10 people? Because we make a lot. Oh, when you do? When you're Even sitting more. There cutting, Holy yeah, cow. You know, so my stock pot is, it's, I have a five-gallon um, stock pot. So we just, when we make, like we made chicken soup yesterday. So we filled the five gallon wow. stock pot. I'm with coming chicken over. Soup. So yeah. yeah. So that was, you know, the leftovers for the next day because to make it all from scratch every day, three meals a day would be way too much. So we, we only do it too. <laughs> so it. yeah. So he goes to the garden, he picks salad or lettuce, puts a salad together and then sets out all the leftovers, heats them up, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, we touch base again at that point, see if anything's changed because you know, the, the day typically doesn't always go as planned. So we can kind of reconvene at that point. I mean, is and, it like structure, like everyone comes together at mealtime or will people kind of trickle in and out depending on what their job is? Um, it, the goal is to have everybody at the same time, but that does not generally happen. So yeah. we, because we're, we're a farm, we do a lot of tours. We have a lot of pretty big agritourism business. Yeah. So, uh, we have set tour times 10 and one, but if people show up, um, because yeah. actually our farm backs up to the highway, the highway 65 in Indiana. So wait, if people want to show up, I mean, mm-hmm. people can show up and take a tour if they yes. want. So yeah, and that's can, why where, I'm where right is it? Time. Yeah. Where so is in, it? We're in Scottsburg, Indiana, okay. which is southeast Indiana. It's about half an hour north of Louisville, about an hour yeah. and a half south. I lived in Louisville. Yeah, yeah great yeah. place. Yeah. Yeah, it's a fun city. Um, and we're right on the highway, which is what makes it so nice. We've got billboards, so it's it's really easy to find us. Um, so sometimes that'll interfere. You know, if someone's dealing with someone on the phone, <laughs> you know, sometimes that can take half an hour with some with some people. Um, so so it kind of trickles in and out because yeah. everybody's got to stop what they're doing, if, especially if they're like in the barn and they're almost done cleaning a stall. They'll you know they'll finish that kind of thing. Right. But um, my husband and I try to be there and kind of tag each of the children to you know to make sure that everybody's good and, and doesn't need help with anything. Um, and then the afternoon, so my kids all run cross country. And so in the afternoon, they generally all have a, a set time for to go running. Um, and they just, they manage their time that way. So like, you know, my oldest son who makes the the soap, you know, he'll just plan his soap making around when he, you know, and that has to do with the weather, that kind of thing. Right. And, um, you know, we get the work done somehow. We Right now, we're the ones covering the farm store um, in the evening. So that's open till six o'clock. So we don't have dinner till six. Um so different people are doing different things. You know, a lot of that in the afternoon. I, I really teach my children that um, the harder you work, the more time you have to do the fun stuff. So this is your job for the day. You know, you need to get it done. You can get it done in two hours. You can get it done in eight hours. You know, how much free time right, you have right. will depend on that. So a lot of them, if they're, you know, really working hard, they'll have some extra free time. Um, and that's where that's where that tends to come from. So you're – you – Go back and you're doing the website stuff. What else do you do? And then your husband, what is his responsibilities? So I do everything. <laughs> um, that's, I, uh, that's, I, I yeah. should have known when I asked that question. Yeah, yeah. I do everything. I kind of like tell my, you know, that I'm the general and I kind of keep everybody going, but I'm the one that initiates everything and gets it started. Um, I'm also a big believer in the Pareto principle, which is the 80 20 rule. So I'll get it like 80% of the way there and then kind of pass it off to everybody else. Um, so I do, you know, all the paperwork, all the bookkeeping, all the, um, HR stuff, you know, all website, um, inventory, that kind of thing. Well, I don't really deal with inventory. I tell them what I want in inventory and they take care of the rest of it. And just so you know, I mean, it's, it's, we do have six full-time employees. It's not just children and us doing all of it. Um, Not not just children's slave labor. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then, and, and the, the employees really help because we can, we go on vacations. We take, um, 
pretty long vacations because since we it's a farm, we work seven days a week. We we try and get off for two to three weeks at a time so to give the kids because I really want the children to be excited about the business. You know, this this yeah. is something that that I want them to take over. Um, we actually have a timeline for that. They've got eight and a half years, and I'm done. <laughs> but that's that's a whole nother story. So uh, yeah, that's, that's so your husband. I, what is what is he? Oh, so he fixes everything that breaks. Yeah. So what's broken like the past week that he had to fix? Oh, everything. So like right now, I, I mentioned before that we split our farm stores. Well, there's no signage for the new farm store. So right now we're walking people back. So he's putting together all the signs mm. for, um, you know, to get people so they're, they know where to go. Uh, we've also had a trouble with, with people smoking where they're not supposed to. So he's putting the smoking sign. So everything that's just, you know, when I say fix it, it can either break or just not working as well and efficiently as we want it to. Mm-hmm. He'll figure out a way to, to make that better. Or, or I'll, you know, <laughs> we have a saying around here that I dream it and he does it. So I'll be like, okay, I think this would be great, you know, and, and I pass it off and he makes it happen. So we're a really good team that way. You have to be. Yeah. What's yeah. your top priority right now for the business? We, so when we started the business, um, it was primarily just goat milk soap. That was our main, yeah. our main product. Yeah. And so and, and, and well, let's back up. So obviously that seems random to people, right? Why goat milk soap? Okay. So I had the dairy goats because I wanted the healthy raw milk for the children. Yeah. And I, you know, and they were, as part of the homeschooling, they were taking care of them. And one day I just was letting the children uh, play around in the bathtub, just splashing around. And for whatever reason, I picked up the baby wash that I had always used. And for the first time I ever looked at the ingredients and I was so upset because it was all these chemicals, petroleum based chemicals and things I didn't want on their skin. So I decided right. I was going to make my own soap. And so I did my research, found out when you make soap, you need to use a liquid. And so most soap is obviously just made with water because that's the cheapest liquid. And um, I decided I was going to put the goat milk in because I knew the goat milk was good to drink. I figured, you know, you hear stories about Cleopatra taking a milk bath. You know, let's let's put the milk in the soap. Let's see what happens, right? Right. So right. when I made it and I put the soap in the shower, my husband's fingers stopped cracking and splitting. Mm. And he'd been a teacher. He was a teacher for seven years, junior high science. And all the chalk and the chalkboard and all of that had been a problem for him for years. And we tried everything and it never, it never went away. And right. all I had to do was make the soap and it, uh, and it, it healed his fingers. That's so amazing. that was kind yeah. of the beginning. And, um, it, I, I taught myself how to program so I could put up a website cause it was before they had all the easy websites, yeah. you know, builders that they have now. Right. So I did that and we then had to figure out how to get people to the website. Yeah. So what we decided to do was start going to craft fairs and kind of trying to sell it out that way. And and it was good because we sold some, but our main goal was to get people awareness. And so we gave out samples to everybody, business cards to everybody. And uh, I started hearing feedback from these moms whose children had eczema. Hmm. And I, I had no idea about eczema. I did not know what a big problem it was. None of my children have it. And these moms were so um, just incredulous that by using our goat milk soap, it was able to fix their children's eczema. And they had tried everything, steroid creams, you know, I mean, you name right. it, bleach baths, they had tried it. And so that was really how the business took off because these moms started telling everybody they knew that our goat milk soap helped um, their, their kids and their eczema. And so when I named the business, I named it Goat Milk Stuff because I really intended to do, you know, everything with goat milk. And the soap just went so crazy so fast. That kind of took our main attention for probably about the first five years. Yeah. yeah. So that that was how, how we got How hard started. is it to, like, initially, is it just you creating it? Yeah. So I was the one who started making the soap. I would make it with my oldest daughter, who was, like, 10 at the time. And um, we would just experiment. You know, we would just make this. We made a bunch for ourselves before we ever really started selling it. So we had a lot of testing under our belts. And uh, eventually I passed it off to my husband um, for him to make it. And so I started my batch size was 30 bars. When my husband took over, his batch size was 120 bars. And then about three years ago, my son Coulter, who was then 15, took it over. And his batch size was 300 bars. So that's kind of how it's it's progressed over um over the years. And, you know, it's, it, it's kind of like, I don't know if, if people have ever made bread. It's, it's both art and science. You know, you follow a recipe, but sometimes you make bread and it comes out great. And sometimes it, you know, doesn't come out at all. And, and soap making is kind of like that as much as it's a science and you have to be really exact with your ingredients and measurements. A lot of it too is the art and understanding what's happening with the soap. Yeah. yeah. So you so, had to figure out how to get people to your website. So you went so you, to these craft shows. Yeah. That was crazy. Okay, so we really didn't know what we were doing. 
um, you know, our, our first, uh, our first craft show, we, our setup was terrible. Our signage was terrible. We had it set up at the table inside the booth and people didn't want to come into the booth in like an hour. I'm like, that's this is ridiculous. People aren't coming in the booth. And I said, you grab that table, you grab that. And we lifted it out and put it outside the tent. And I said, okay, kids, come here. And I gave them all the samples and I, and I stuck them in front of the table and said, you give one of these to every person who passes by. And that was, you know, kind of how, it, it just really started. We started to get our feet wet with doing it, you know, trying to teach the children um, how to talk to people was actually really easy because it turns out my children are all natural born salesmen. That's good. I, yeah. I tell the story that my, my one son was um, talking to this customer at a craft show and he went through everything, how we raised the goats, how we made the soap, everything. Talked to the guy for about 10 minutes. And after the 10 minutes, the guy started to walk away and said to my son, he said, wow, you're really a good salesman. And my son literally yelled after him, I'm only a good salesman if you buy something. <laughs> That's what he said. And the guy turned around and bought a bar of soap. That's and, funny. You know, you can't teach children that kind of stuff. I mean, they're just really, uh, because they believe in it. You know, they've grown up doing it, so they understand it. They know the difference it makes. And so that makes it easy for them to, to sell it to other people. So you got you started got with the start. craft shows. What else did you do that drove traffic to the website and, and sales? That was really it. I mean, we, we've not advertised. We, we do very little with, with anything like that. It's primarily word of mouth. Um, we've had, obviously, the, the publicity that you mentioned at the beginning was, yeah. was very huge. That first one, our first time we were on television, uh, actually came about because of a craft fair. We were at a local high school in Louisville where it was um, a Christmas show that was put on by the baseball team. And all the baseball moms were coming around giving the vendors donuts. <laughs> and my kids, of course, swarmed the donut cart and was talking to this, this baseball mom, telling her everything, just, you know, chatting her up. And she ended up coming over to me and saying, I have got to interview you. And she was the lead anchor on our local on the Louisville television oh, wow. station. And so that was kind of the beginning of how of how all that publicity started. You know, I tell people that the the stuff we make with with goat milk the, the goat milk soap you know the cheese all of that is wonderful it's excellent it's high quality but you can't diminish the fact that our story is different it's exceptional you don't see a lot of children yeah. being taught how to run a business nowadays um and that's that's really in my opinion really lacking you know i, I think that we you know, we did a good thing when we, we created the child labor laws, right? I mean, no child should be in a, in a factory, in a mine, working and doing that. But I think we went really overboard and we really um, made it went so... Went to the opposite so, end of the spectrum. Yeah, so, so parents and people in general don't think kids are nearly as capable as they are. And in doing that, I think it's led a lot to this entitlement mentality and, and all of that. And Whereas if you give a child a job that they can learn, that they can be good at, they can grow up to be entrepreneurs. They hit, you know, their adulthood already yeah. on track, and it just makes a huge difference. Yeah. So, what would you say, PJ? You know, someone has four, five, six-year-old. What should they? And they don't live on a farm. They're in the you know city. What should they start doing with their kids now to start to instill some of those things? Well, the easiest thing is to just start with chores. You mm -hmm. know, my kids clean the toilets. They're on, you know the toilets from the time they were five. Now, they didn't do as good a job as I could. They didn't uh, do it as quickly as I could, but they could do it. And I could come along once a month and, you know, kind of give it a little deeper scrubbing. But if parents would take the time to teach their children how to do those things instead of doing the jobs for them, that starts to build their children's confidence. That starts to build their children's ability to say, hey, I can do that, you know, was quit solving their problems for them. You know, I almost never yeah. give my children an answer. Um, the other thing that I, I find really valuable is a garden. You know, almost everybody can garden. Even if you're in an apartment, you can usually find a space where you can put in a garden. And what a garden does is uh, teaches children, especially at those young age, number one, where their food comes, which is huge. Most yeah. people do not understand where their food comes from. You mean from. Doritos doesn't come out of the Exactly. Ground? You would be amazed at the number of people who don't realize milk comes from an animal after she's had birth and <laughs> given birth. You know, they think, oh, all the boys do. Well, they, they, and then the number of people who think that babies are born giving milk. Like, yeah, no, that, that's not how it works. Um, and it gives them a taste for fresh vegetables, which clearly is, is uh, something that most modern kids in this environment are lacking. And it gets their hands dirty. Um, and that's something that um, I think we've really lost in American society. You know, the ability that 
that hard work and getting your hands dirty is something you want to try and outgrow, right? You want to go to college so you don't have to do that. And there's a lot to be said for getting your hands dirty, whether it's in the actual dirt, whether it's, you know, working on a job. Um, If you can just throw yourself fully into it, then again, you're, you're better off than, you know, a hundred of your peers at your age. So that's something that, that parents, if they can really say, think to themselves that they're growing future adults and, you know, and not just dealing with children, it's a very different mindset. So with all this, how do you have time to homeschool? When do they actually have time for that? What I do is I, don't segregate anything. Everything is integrated here. So whether it's family time, play time, free time, school time, work time, it's all done together. So for example, we, um, the packaging that we use for our soaps is a little cotton drawstring bag. And I picked that because my two-year-old could do it. She could open the bag, put the bar soap in, put a card in, pull the drawstring shut. Well, you know, we do hundreds of thousands of bars of soap. Those all need to be bagged. So what we do is while we're doing that, you know, I'll sit there and I'll, I'll quiz them on math facts or negative numbers or we'll have discussions. You know, the the, um, the election that we just went through was a hot topic around here. We, we talked about that a lot in the Electoral College and the Founding Fathers and all of those things. You know, this, we, we talked about this, the election of 1800 and how hotly contested that was and compared it to the election of this year. So all of that's done while we're doing some of those, you know, while right. we're, when they're milking goats, you know, they're just sitting out there. I mean, it's something that, you know, yes, your hands are busy and yes, you have to pay attention, but your mind, there's a lot that you can talk about. Um, the other thing that I'm really um, important with is I taught them from the very beginning to love to read. And I say one of my biggest jobs as a homeschooling mom is putting the proper books in front of them. Mm-hmm. Because if I can get them reading quality You know, I mean, we read fiction too, but quality nonfiction books. We love historical fiction, all of that stuff. They get this this world view um, that that's important. You know, an idea that life is bigger than just what's in front of them. Right. And so we do a lot of that. Obviously, with science, we do a lot with just the nature around us. Um, And I tell people that my children, they don't cover everything they would cover in public school. Um, That's not my goal to do that. My goal is to teach them to learn, to teach them how to learn and to teach them to love to learn. Because I didn't know how to make soap. I didn't know how to run a business. I didn't know how to hire people, fire people. I mean, that was all stuff I had to teach myself. And so because they're learning less, they're putting it all into practice and so they're remembering it. And so it's very practical. They're not, you know, learning all this stuff, studying, cramming for a test and then forgetting it all the next day. Yeah. Um, so it's 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 different. It's a it's, yeah, it's a more integrated. Yeah, I see what you mm-hmm. mean. So, what are your favorite nonfiction of all time that people should that are must reads for you? Oh gosh, I don't know that I could say of all time. I just finished the um, the seven hundred page Hamilton biography that <laughs> the Ron Charnow did. That was the musical Broadway show Hamilton was based on. Right. Yeah. That's- yeah fascinating it was fascinating i just got my son um a book called uh, i forget what it's called it's washington spying i think it was and it was the six spies that washington used during the revolution mm-hmm. that was really cool we like a lot of um you know kind of true life um things that were difficulty that people had to overcome a lot yeah. of biographies 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 yeah. yeah any other favorite biographies for you um um, of course you're asking me now, so I'm drawing a total blank. My husband just did the Tom, uh, Thomas Jefferson biography, which was really fun because he was reading Thomas Jefferson while I was reading it with Alexander Hamilton. And so we would be, you know, we would cover these same, these same, uh, events and from their different perspectives right. and do that. Um, no, we really like early American history. It's, yeah. it's, you know, this perception that we have of how noble our founding fathers were, um, is really neat because yes, they were noble, but they were also very flawed human beings. And so it's a fascinating study to realize that you can accomplish much and still make a whole lot of mistakes and be so wrong right. on so many issues. And and the, you start to get into that and have these conversations with, right. you know, not just your children, but your, your spouse. And yeah. it really is opening as to just how humanity works. Yeah. Well, that's what I love about these interviews too, is on the surface and everything, if they see someone on the Today Show or wherever, everything looks amazing. But there's challenge, day-to-day challenges. There's some mistakes. Um, what would you say, looking back on your business, what are some things you're like, okay, I definitely, some big learning 
learning opportunities. Yeah. Well, before I say that, I want to tell you that, you know, one of the things that I always have to to remind people is that when they see these overnight successes, Mm -hmm. they don't realize the decades of hard work that went into becoming a, you know, an overnight success. And that's something that a lot of people really think that it happens like that. And sometimes it does, but mostly because there were a whole lot of failures. I don't, right. Most of the time. Yeah, exactly. Overnight success after 10 years. Exactly. So one of the things that I had the hardest times when the business, um, when Goat Milk Stuff became more than just the family could handle and we needed to start hiring people, I really botched that pretty, <laughs> pretty well. Really? Um, I did. I, I went in with the perception that, that the people I hired were going to work as hard as my children. And that was really a false perception. And I, and I say that, you know, and, and I feel badly saying that. And the people that we have now are wonderful. But I could grow so much more if I could hire people. I'm trying to hire two or three people right now, and I can't find them. I can't find the people that have the work ethic. And so I really, um, I did that very, very wrong. I, I didn't know how to hire. I didn't know how to interview. Um, yeah, what I'm did still- you do wrong at the time that you don't you know? Even know? Well, and okay, so we're a little bit different in that we have, you know, my children work. And so a lot of it was I I focused on people that I could trust around my children, that I, I wasn't worried about that. And I wouldn't have undone that. But I would also at the same time have looked more at their skills and their expectations uh, because that's where I really found the disconnect was, um, you know, <laughs> two of our first hires, they, uh, they would tell people that um, the two of them did all the work and my children got all the credit. And, you know, A, that was completely false. My children worked a lot and, and one could argue a lot harder than they could. But I didn't manage that, you know, that well. Um, you know, like I the would. the culture, give, you mean? Like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, just their expectations that, okay, yes, w- you know, when we go on the Today Show, you know, it, it's not going to be focused on you. <laughs> you know, that's not, um, that that's not where the story is here. Right. And so, um, you know, I've learned managing expectations is much more important than I thought. And just because I communicate it doesn't mean they're hearing it. Um, and so it's that constant repetition of, you know, okay, we're on the same page, right? You understand where we're going here with this and where the goal is and the timing and, and all of that. So I have I definitely not, uh, I haven't arrived. I have a lot more growing to do in that, but I've learned some really hard lessons and um, which, which were painful at the time. They were very painful at the time, but I really think for the long term is going to make it, um, make, you know, make it milk stuff that much better. I mean, hiring is a challenge for, I would say, most entrepreneurs. Um, what else? What else has been a big challenge uh, in the business? Well, when we started, we, we were at a three-acre homestead. Uh, that was where we started. And we quickly outgrew that. We started in 2008. By 2011, it was obvious we, we couldn't stay there. And so we went looking for a new farm and we found this current farm that we're on now. It's 36 acres. Like I said, backs up to the highway. So it's less than a mile off the interstate. We have high speed internet. It's, it's a perfect location for us. So we put, we put in the offer and it was accepted. And, uh, we found out after that, that they had told us it was zoned agriculture, but it was actually zoned residential. And so we, wow. went, yeah, it was pretty bad. And so we had to go through the process of getting it rezoned. Well, during that, um, a lot of people came out against us, um, and which I, you know, I understood that, right? You, Why? you tell people there's going to be, well, there's a subdivision right across the road from us. Um, you know, you tell people there's going to be a, a goat farm and people think dirty, nasty, whatnot, which is not ours. Our place is beautiful. And they've since come and said, you know, this is the best thing that's happened to this area. So they're on our side now. But I didn't understand how political things were. I'd never really dealt with that before. It always been something, you know, um, my husband, as a, tells me that I think the, probably the greatest compliment he ever gave me, he told me that I've never met a problem I couldn't solve. And so, you know, you, you throw something at me, I, I figure it out and I, I make it happen. I make it work. And this was something I couldn't do that. I couldn't apply that. It, it was, you know, that the, the, it was the out of your control. Yeah. And, and, you know, because we weren't born here, we weren't from here. We were, you know, quote outsiders, there was a lot of um, talking that needed to be done, and that was a very, very different something thing than I had ever dealt with. Um, again, I think it slowed down the business. We weren't able to to move as fast. We weren't able to get the um, 
the building started, but long term, it's you know now they're all on our side, and we built some connections there that really helped. Another thing that we had during that process, which was really uh, I had a really hard time uh, dealing with at the time, was we couldn't get funding um, because we are funding a farm for for the business for for mm. construction because we are a farm because we are a home and because we manufacture products. And so there were no loan programs. We couldn't get a regular mortgage because we had the farm and the manufacturing. We couldn't get a farm loan because we had the house. We couldn't, you know, all of, and, and the manufacturing, all of those things. Um, so, you know, we had excellent credit. We, we had the financials to show that we could, you know, we could afford to do this, but we couldn't get a, a loan until we actually found a bank that was willing to keep it in-house and write it in-house. And so that was another, like, what do you, what do you mean you're not going to give me a loan? I'm, you know, I always pay my bills. I have great credit. This is, this is ridiculous. But to realize that it's not always set up for the entrepreneur to do what the entrepreneur wants to do and is capable of. Um, another thing that we learned during that, that process was, it's not about being a profitable business. You know, I, I really thought that it was, that that's what is important. No, it's about cash flow. If you can't manage cash flow, it doesn't matter how profitable you are, you will go out of business. And so, you know, all of those things, which, which were different from, you know, managing a home budget, managing, you know, a little small cottage industry, but taking it from that to becoming a, a quote, real business with all the product liability insurance and, you know, all of those things that you have to cover was a huge, huge learning experience that took a long time. So what did you learn about managing cash flow that we should know? You know, what I've done is Because you're right, I that just, is, that's, that's it huge, is. yeah. Yep, you know, and especially if you start getting publicity. You know, you start, you get something major and it sells out all of your your stuff and you have to then build up your website and you have to do all of these other things. Um, you know, we don't, um, we don't spend money still. To this day, we've been in business for um, eight years now on anything that does not return money, right? So my house, you know, we built this house on this farm. My house still isn't finished because it doesn't, it doesn't make me any money. It's good enough now for, for what we need to do, but everything goes into something that has a return. You know, the shorter return better, but some of them obviously are, are longer term. So it's, it's wise buying habits. I mean, you're going to waste money. There, there's going to be decisions you make that you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I just wasted all that money. And, and you have to do that because you don't always know what's going to work. But to have, you know, say you, you think you should have, you know, 30,000 in reserve funds, right? I would say double that, if not tripling that, because, um, you know, you need it. And so when you're when you're starting to, to get some success and you're like, oh, you know, let's go take a vacation. You're like, no, I, you know, 30,000 in reserves isn't enough. I need to get much higher because as the business grows, it's got to be a lot higher than that. And you've, you know, you have a lot of, products. I mean, you have soaps, you have lotions, you have like, I think lip balms. Yeah. What products worked really well that maybe surprised you? Obviously the soap is is a staple and what didn't work as well that you had to cut? Uh, the one probably thing that, that took us by surprise the most was the laundry soap. So we make laundry soap and I had no idea that people were going to care and find that big a difference in laundry soap. Um, and it, again, it turns Why'd out- Why'd you even start it then? I mean, how'd you even know to, to do it? Because I was saving money for my family. <laughs> oh, so you were making it. It was making it for us, yeah. I gotcha, yeah, I gotcha. Oh, well, I make this for us. I might as well, I might as well offer it for sale. And it turns out um, that in commercial detergents, there's a chemical called an optical brightener that they add to the laundry soap. And what this does is it sticks to your clothing and it tricks your eye into making your clothes look brighter than they actually mm, are. Didn't know that. And yeah, no, most people don't. I didn't when I started. I actually found out that most military are not allowed to use those detergents because it um, affects the night vision goggles. They can show up in night vision. Mm. Um, but what happens, because in order for it to work, it has to stick to your clothing, that causes a lot of irritation for people. It causes a lot of people rashes and dry skin and, again, the eczema, psoriasis. And so by switching to the something that just washes out, it doesn't have any scent added, it, it makes a huge difference for people. So we honestly have, have trouble keeping up with the demand for that. It's, it's probably one of the, the more surprising things. So you uh, should be the official soap of the military? Official laundry soap? Yeah, I don't, I don't want to go there. <laughs> that, that would be a whole nother building, a whole lot more equipment. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll supply the, you know, the individual soldier here and there. 
Um, my brother's actually in the military, so, so he uses it. But um, as far as stuff that, uh, that we've ended up um, not carrying, a lot of the stuff we, we um, have ended up um, letting go has not been because it hasn't been good, but just because there's not enough uh, people that like a demand. want it. Yeah, there's just not enough, and it's time-consuming. Um, so, and, and then the other thing is that people don't want to pay the price that we would need to charge. You know, a lot of people don't understand, uh, just how much more expensive it's it labor is when intensive. You're running. Yeah. When you're running a small business, you don't have the breaks of the large corporations. You don't have all of those, those benefits that, that are enable it to really drop the prices. So for example, when we started candy, um, we make the most incredible goat milk truffles. They're oh, so the candy good. looks amazing. I think I saw turtles on the side. Yeah. yeah. They look really good. Yeah. Um, yeah. but you know, they're, they're very, like you said, labor intensive, you know, we're hand rolling them, which, you know, dipping them one at a time and people just really didn't want to pay the price that we were charging for them. So, you know, that's something that we've let that go, but we bring it back periodically around like Valentine's day, we'll bring it back and, you know, we run different specials here and there. So, uh, you know, a lot of that is just, is matching up the market. Um, and then as far as with the goats, cause the goat milk soap is our, our most popular product. We then have to deal with which scents to offer. So we have a lot of unscented varieties because like I said so many people have skin problems um but then it's all you know we have right now about 35 different scents but everybody's always wow. asking us for a different one that we don't have and so we ended up figuring out with that that we do custom batches so if they want one we'll we'll find that custom scent for them and make them a batch of their own that you know that they can have for them so that's kind of how we handle that but it is it's constantly it's just that constant feedback between uh, you and your customers. You you have to constantly yeah, be listening sure. to them, knowing what they want, being responsive. Um, and sometimes, you know, that, that doesn't mean that it's going to be as profitable because it takes so much extra time to deal with those, you know, those custom batches and things like that. But you can't underestimate um, the customer loyalty, the word of mouth, um, and just being different, you know, most companies now, you, you, you can't even ask them something special. They'll just like laugh you off. So to be able to be responsive isn't always the most responsive, um, uh, profitable thing, but it's definitely worth it for, you know, just, just our company and, and what we want to provide our, our, our customers. How do you decide what to say yes to and what not to? Like, what's an example where you, you just made it, even though you're getting demand for it, you decided no. And then how are you okay? Because it's a lot of time and energy and effort to do this labor intensive. When you launch, even if it's just one bar of soap with a scent, now it's taking the time and attention away from something else. One of the main things we do is does it add to goat milk stuff? Is this part of our core business? Is this something that is, you know, healthy? Um, is this something that is natural? Is this something that has to do with goats? You know, all of those things. So, so does it meet that? Um, and there are a couple things. So one of the things that people are surprised about is that we don't make a goat milk lotion, okay? We make a solid lotion. So think like the consistency of a big lip balm. And the reason we do that is because when you make a liquid lotion that has goat milk, bacteria is going to grow in that environment. And so to keep the bacteria from growing, you have to put chemical preservatives in. And I won't do that. I don't think it's safe. I think adding all those chemical preservatives, you've just completely undone all the goodness of the goat you've milk. You've negated, yeah. Yeah. So people are like, but your goat milk stuff, what do you mean you don't have any goat, lo goat milk lotion? I'm like, I'm sorry. I don't believe it's a safe product. And, and my, you know, my motto has always been, if I won't use it on my children, I will not make it for sale. That's kind of my, you know, my test gauge. If, if I don't think it's good enough for us, it's, it's not going to be something, even if people want it, it's not going to be something I make. So we do the solid lotion instead. And that has a huge following, but there's a lot of education that we have to give people because it's, it's, for most people, it's not a product they've tried. And once they try it, they love it. But there's a lot of, okay, you know, here, you want a test sample? We can, you know, we can try this. And, and you have to teach them how to use it. Because they, they're used to the liquid. and Yeah. yeah. Which is diluted. And so you have to use a lot. But with ours, because it's not diluted, it only takes a very little bit. So, um, you know, so, th so there's things like that, that, that you just have to, you know, sometimes you do have to say no and, and people don't agree with it. And they're like, oh, I won't tell anybody that that's what you're doing. And like, no, I'm sorry. I can't do that. What's the PJ, what's the uh, process for launching a product? So let's say, okay, yes, we're going ahead. What do you do next? 
Okay, so I will be the first one to admit that I do not do that as well as I should. I should build That's a the lot answer more. that everyone says. Yeah, I should build a lot more hype. Can. Yep, yeah. I should, you know, people, oh, this is coming, it's coming. We don't. We make it. We put it out there. A lot of times because, um, you know, we test things. So, like, for example, you know, we'll test a different goat milk soap scent. And we'll How find out. How do you test it? Uh, like we make it your- and then we use it and then we have to wait because like what will happen is over time some of the scents will completely fade. They'll just disappear. For example, you, know, you can't really can't make an orange scented soap because it just it just dissolves. We tried pink grapefruit and it just goes away. And so we'll do it as a test. So we'll say, OK, we're testing a batch of orange grapefruit. So like a week, you know, a month, two months go by. And no, then we'll make a batch we'll put, and we'll put it at half price. Yeah. Send it out and we'll say, OK, you know, this is a test batch. We don't know how this is going to go. Give us your feedback. And so people are excited because they get a test batch um, and then they give us, you know, and, and the hard part with that is some people will love it and everybody else will hate it. And then you're like, you have to tell the people. Sorry, who we're not Sorry. making this anymore. You're yeah. Unusual. yeah. You know, or it's a new hit. Like one of the things that someone asked us to make um, an activated bamboo charcoal soap. And okay. I thought, well, that sounds really kind of strange and unnecessary but i was like all right so you know because it's just a matter of we actually had the the charcoal because we put it in cheese sometimes and so we put it in the soap and it's now one of our most popular soaps you know and i was like who knew it's not something i ever would have done but uh if people really like it so yeah like i said really listening is important and and after a while you, know, you have to be careful because obviously your gut can be wrong, but your gut kind of tells you, you know, when you've done it for so long, what's going to, what's worth trying and what's, what's not. Where can people get the products? They can get it. Obviously they can buy it right direct through the website at goatmilkstuff.com um, or your farm. Are there other places, retailers or online platforms that they can get it? Yeah, no, online is just at our at our website. And uh, we do have a couple of specialty shops around the country, but it's really just you know, individual mom and pop stores. Uh, one of the things that I am trying to get to, um, hopefully in 2017 is hire someone for going after wholesale accounts. Um, that's something that is just, it, it, it's a full-time job. It's not, <laughs> I do not have any room to add that to my plate. And, and not even close. Children, yeah, no, not even close. None of the children are capable of doing it. So it's something that if we can find, you know, the right person, uh, because I do think, you know, a lot of people have wanted us to get it in more mainstream stores that I can say, oh, yeah, it's at your local, you know, Kroger or whatever. Um, so, you know, down the line, that's it. But right now we're just keeping up with our retail demand is, you know, really keeps us busy, especially because we've we've added all the food products, all the cheese and the candy and caramel and all of that. So, you know, soap is kind of nice because you can make it ahead of time and store it um, with the cheese. It's, it's You don't have quite that shelf life. So it takes a little more being on top of things. Any other platforms, like, can people get it on Amazon or any of these other? No. No. Tell me about that. Amazon. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, um, I, I do use Amazon. Um, and I do like the fact that you can get things very cheaply on there, but I don't think Amazon, uh, supports small businesses. I think that a lot of small businesses think that it's, it's easy to sell on Amazon because they do so much of the work. And a lot of that is true for a lot of people who are just doing that. But I think Amazon is really getting too big and really focusing on putting a lot of the smaller guys out of business and they have way too much control. So we looked at it at one point because um, my son actually wanted us to do it. Right. And I would not make any money by the time you handle all of those. There's a lot of fees. Fees. Yeah. Um, unless I were to like bundle and have like a 10, you know, a 10 bar of soap. Well, how many people are going to go on and try, you know, 10 bars? Let me just, yeah, let me just try this 20 pack. Yeah. So, I mean, if you wanted to do it as an advertising and say, okay, this, I'm going to consider this advertising, but I don't think that really helps you grow your business. Yeah. So, um, what about like Etsy? We actually do have a shop on Etsy. You're right. I forgot about that. Um, And I don't really do much with it. I just have it as a placeholder. We do sell stuff. um, Do people go on and buy through Etsy or is it not that popular? Uh, No, we we have sales on that. It was actually kind of funny when um, we were on the Huckabee show the we upped our website as as high as we could and it's still they still managed to crash our website and so people were um and it was down for maybe half an hour but during Mm -hmm. that time everybody found us on etsy and we're buying it all through etsy so it actually turned out to be a really good uh backup secondary backup channel yeah Yeah. what do you use to run the business software wise or platform wise like what shopping cart or platform do you use for for your site we use xcart so it is a 
Yep, it is highly. We have one of the most highly customized X cart systems out there that Why I've X cart? ever seen. Um, at the time, it was what was the most robust shopping cart that you could start rather inexpensively and keep adding on all the additions as your website grew. Um, and then, like I said, we've we've got it very highly customized. Most people would never think that that's what it is because it's, we've changed it so much. Um, but it's just you know I I can do pretty much anything I want with with some programming, um, which I don't do. I, I pay somebody to do it. But that was we, just early on. You do the programming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My my little custom with my little PayPal buttons, and I was really proud of that website. But this one is is much nicer and works much better. So it's it was highly customizable. Be able to grow with us. Um, and so that's what we use for that. I have a WordPress blog on there, which I've been um, so overwhelmed with work that I haven't been posting anything on. But I'm going to get back to that hopefully, hopefully soon. <laughs> so Xcart, WordPress, anything else to manage? You know, no, I, I uh, inventory or anything. Yeah, else? so we actually just use Excel for inventory. Um, we just use cash registers. We don't use any. We've looked into getting like, um, you know, some of the the different systems they have for point of sale and the farm store and stuff, um, which would, which would gather some more data for us. But we, um, we gather it on the supply side, on the making of it side, the manufacturing side, as opposed to the the sales side, you know, how much we're restocking in there as opposed to what's selling. Cause I just can't, I just can't justify, you know, 80 to a hundred dollars a month just to be able to gather that when I can, when I can do it on a, on a spreadsheet. Um, I gave up, um, QuickBooks several years ago because I hated QuickBooks with a passion, and what ended it's up a love hate thing. Yeah. Oh, hate QuickBooks. Well, and I was using it, um, but what happens, and most people don't realize this, is there's only a limited number of customers in QuickBooks, and when you max out the customers, which is what we did, then you have to go to their uh, professional version, which at that time, about four years ago, was ten thousand dollars, and I was like forget it. I know I have all my customer information in my, you know, in X cart. I don't need to have it duplicated there. So I just use Quicken now. Quicken has a home and business um, version and that's, it gets all everything my accountant needs and a whole lot easier and simpler. So PJ, how did you end up on a farm? <laughs> um, totally. Uh, that was a God thing. I grew up, I actually grew up on an island off the coast of New Jersey. Really? I mean, yep, I did. Long Beach Island. Um, we, uh, had no ocean for a house. We were one of the few year round families. So my husband, my husband, my brother and I had, um, the lifeguards would pull their, their boats up over the winter and we would each have one and we would like move and have our, all our stuff down in there and, um, keep it, have our own like little playhouses down on the beach under the upturned, uh, rowboats and stuff. And, um, I went to school at the university of Virginia. When you were growing up there, what did you want to be when you grew up? I don't ever remember having any. I was too busy having fun. I really don't remember ever wanting to be anything. Um, just enjoying. Yeah. My mom's... I mean, to- I just... I'm curious. At that age, did you know, I want to have a big family? I mean... Yeah, What were yeah. you thinking? Then? Yeah, I or maybe I you weren't. Have a big family. Um, I, my, in fact, my uh, best friend from high school told me that she remembers us sitting in biology class and me telling her I wanted eight children. Really? I, yeah, I don't remember that conversation, but but she swears by that. And, um, Something you can't make up. Like, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So I did. I knew I wanted a big family. We just took them one at a time. And, um, you know, it was just something that I've just always enjoyed doing stuff and keeping busy. You know, I had my first paper route when I was 10. My first job, I had a checkbook when I was 10 and would pay all my own bills. And, you know, very self-sufficient, very independent. Went to school at the University of Virginia for engineering and met my husband there. And then... We, uh, I worked for three years and had my first daughter and was like, that's it. I do not want to work anymore. I want to be a stay at home mom. And so it was just a matter of how, you know, we were really in debt. We had a lot of school debt. We yeah. moved to Jersey to be closer to family, which is a really expensive um, place to live. And so I started tutoring and uh, working very purposefully on paying off the debt. We paid off, um, it was about $75,000 in College three was expensive. So off. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and then, and so I had a couple kids at that point and I, like I said, I was just really wanted healthy food for them and, uh, you know, tried to talk my husband into getting chickens. My husband says that chickens are the gateway animal. And so once I, I, yeah, once I convinced him to get chickens, the, the goats were pretty close behind. We had moved to Indiana by that point. So Uh, yeah, what brought you to Indiana? The homeschooling laws. So 
Yeah, we knew we were leaving New Jersey because we really just got priced out. It was just, it was not the kind of uh, environment that we wanted to raise our family in. We were living in Trenton, uh, which is inner city Trenton. My husband was teaching at a charter school in inner city Trenton. Had a little postage stamp lot, you know, and the kids, it was, it was unsafe. So the kids weren't it's allowed to It's a rough, out. rough area. Yep. Yep. Um, we were doing a lot of ministry with his students and stuff. And uh, we were like, okay, we, we really just don't want to do this anymore. And so we started looking for, you know, where we wanted to live, what was important to us. You know, my husband grew up in the mountains. He didn't want it to be completely flat. You know, I wanted to be by the ocean. I didn't get, I didn't get that part of my wish. But as we talked about all of the stuff that was really important to us, what became really obvious was everything was around the homeschooling. You know, that was, we, that we're was hard a workers. core we value a that you wanted. Yeah. yeah. You know, we could get a job anywhere. We, we weren't worried about making a living. Um, but there are some homeschooling is legal on the federal level, but it's regulated on the state level. And there are some states that make it really miserable to homeschool, um, which Pennsylvania was one of them. We make a lot of family wanted us to move to Pennsylvania. I was like, there's no way yeah. I'm going to Pennsylvania. And so Indiana had really friendly homeschool laws and um, and really good business laws, too, which, you know, we always kind of thought maybe someday we'd, we'd do something on the side and had no idea it was ever going to become this. That was that was never in our in our dreams. And so that's how we, we got out here. Yeah, but you still could have not lived on a farm. You just wanted the healthy food. Well, I wanted the children to be kept busy. I'm a big believer that uh, too much free time is <laughs> gets children into trouble. Yeah. And so I really wanted them to have, to have the outside chores and, and the understanding of life and death. I mean, yes, you can have a dog or a cat, but bottom line, you know, you have to take it out. You have to feed it. But if you don't take care of a dairy goat that needs to, to be milked and you forget to shut the fence and gate or whatnot, you know, th that's life and death kind of stuff. Yeah. And so yeah. that was a, a big part of it. Um, you know, and we just, you know, we had three acres. It was, it was nice because there was plenty of room for the kids to roam, but it, it wasn't a huge farm by any means. Yeah. That's amazing. Yes. <laughs> um, how do you decide on growth? Like I remember we mentioned the military, like, no, I don't want, I don't want that headache. You know, how do you, what's the balance between a certain amount of growth and too much growth for you? It's really hard to be perfectly honest. Um, so when we decided that we were going to um, add the, the food products, the goat cheese, the milk, all of that, yeah. that was a lot of, a lot of prayer, a lot of family meetings went into that because that we knew was going to be a huge change because yeah. In order to get certified and go through all that regulation, you can't do it small. You, you know, if you want to bake bread and sell bread, most states have a, a home exemption law for the foods that are not very risky. But you can't do that with cheese. Cheese, <laughs> yeah. You have to go. All, it's, you know, it's go big or go home. Um, I, I, I've said to people, in hindsight, I'm not sure I would have done it had I known just how bad it was going to be. You know, we are in that. You know, I, I thought when I was adding the foods that it was going to be adding a new product line to goat milk stuff. And it hasn't been, it's been starting a new business completely really? from scratch. And so when you start a business, you know, you've got all of those years at the beginning where you have to put the infrastructure into place. You have to have everything ready, but you're not selling as much as you can produce. Yeah, and yeah. so it's, it's steadily growing. And that's what we wanted because, you know, I learned early on that rapid growth is really hard. Um, I'd much rather have it slow and steady. And that's why we've got all the billboards on the highway. So people coming off the highway to, you know, to come and shop and, and do that. We just started making gelato, which is like a ice cream yeah. and, so, and serving that. So that's been a big change for people because that, you know, helps um, prompt a lot of the repeat and the, and the locals who nice, would really. you know, not necessarily run out of their soap that they bought just yet, but they can come in, you know, for, for the gelato. And so, um, you know, growth always sounds really, really good. But when you have trouble hiring people and, um, you know, you're already working as, just, yeah. as hard yeah. as you want, growth isn't always um, uh, oh, isn't always a good thing because you could really push yourself too far. Yeah. Um, it's one yeah. thing when you can, can easily find people and, um, you know, if you don't need very skilled labor. But, you know, it's not just anybody that can come in and make cheese. That's, that's a pretty specialized position and someone that has to be really trustworthy. So it is a, it is a balancing it is a balancing act. Yeah. It is a um, you know okay let's let's take this slowly. Let's you know let's just add one kind of cheese this year. You know next year we'll add another. Um, we've been working on so this year we had our our um, well last year we did the soft cheese which is called a chev, and so this year we added feta, and then next year we'll be adding the pressed cheese. 
So, you know, there's a lot of people with first year, oh, do you have pressed cheese? And I'm like, we will, but not yet. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to overwhelm us where this is the cheese we're developing. This is the cheese we're perfecting. We'll get there. And so, you know, I could have sold it had I added it right away, but I'm not sure that um, it would have helped the long-term goal of the business. What is the process of the one you started with as far as making the cheese? Well, the chef, the, that's what I had made for our family for years. Okay. I, you know, I, I, I could make that. My kids, my, my five-year-old knows how to make it. <laughs> you know? Really? They don't, uh, they don't now because we sell it and you have to do a whole lot more paperwork because of the state regs. But it's, it's something that we had perfected. Yeah. We knew what to do. We knew all the ins and outs. We knew the pitfalls. We knew how to make it taste good and everything. So it was a really easy one for us to start with. Yeah. PJ, this is remarkable. I really appreciate you sharing your story. Um, I always ask this inspired insider, what's been the lowest moment and then what's and how you push through and what's been one of the proudest moments? I would definitely say the lowest moment was um, when I realized that uh, the people I had hired was not were not going to work out Hmm. Um, because we knew them. They were friends of ours and, and whatnot. And that was really painful. And not not because they're bad people, not because we're bad people, just because it's not a good fit. You know, I tell that people all the time, it, it, you know, you can have a great person with a highly skilled, you know, everything, and it's just not a good fit in your company. But if someone leaves their job, you know, and comes on with you, then you have that response. Yeah, or I do. I it's feel a big that responsibility. responsibility. Yeah. yeah. So that was definitely the lowest and, and having, you know, the, the first time you have to fire somebody, yeah. that's, that's really and hard. And they're a friend. Yeah, yeah, that that's really difficult. Um, definitely the low point. Um, the high point was definitely moving to this property. You know, moving to this property, realizing that that we can grow old here. You know, I can keep expanding this business quite a lot on this property, um, and watching the children really come into their own on this. You know, I mentioned before that um, I've I've given the children when. Um, when the youngest turns 18, which is in eight and a half years now, my husband and I are done with the business. I said, I'll be happy to, you know, give a tour, bag soap, give an interview, but I'm not hiring anybody, firing anybody, paying a bill, making a decision, dealing with contractors, you know, any of that stuff. Um, and so right now, all eight say they want to work goat milk stuff when they're older. You know, there's, some of them are still pretty young, so we'll see if any of that changes. But seeing that with this farm, it's big enough and we can add enough stuff that they can all work and support a family doing it and watching them really step up to those challenges and learn things that, you know, like, for example, my uh, my son had a my 18 year old had a meeting today with a different payroll company because that's trying to get us to switch payroll. Yeah. And he's like, Mom, what do you want to do? I'm like, I don't care. That's that's up to you. You're going to be the one doing right, the payroll. Right. You decide whether you want to switch or not. What are and the so, options? Well, exactly. And what are the costs? And, you know, I said, make sure you ask about hidden costs because they're not always going to tell you everything. So kind of training him in that and watching them step out of their comfort zones and succeed at it has been just just really awesome. PJ, what else is on the farm? Like you have goats, obviously. What else? Yeah. So we have right now we just have the dairy goats. Mm -hmm. Um, We have uh, alpine goats, which are the big milk breed. But we also got we do what's called a baby goat experience where people can come and spend half an hour in the baby goat pen, which is it's a favorite here. And so because our alpine babies grew so big so quickly, we ended up getting a couple of miniature goats. So we have some miniature um, goats as well Mm. that that we use in that Uh, we have chickens for the eggs and we have rabbits for the manure for the garden. Um, so those are the only animals we've in the past at our other place. We've had just about everything, turkey, sheep, cows, you name it. We pretty much, we didn't do llamas. Llamas was about the one thing I didn't do, but, um, in all of that really found that we really love the goats. We're really goat people. You know, we love their personalities. Every goat has a name. They answer to their names. You know, I was watching, I was hanging out with the goats yesterday and watched one of them undo the, the gate chain with her tongue. I was like, you, I was talking to her as she was doing it. I'm like, no, you can't do that. And she just kept working it and got the whole thing undone. I'm like, okay, we got to fix that. Um, but they're, you know, they're really fun. We really enjoy them. Yeah. So that's what we have for animals. We have a huge garden, really big garden. And um, we have multiple buildings on the, on the property. I think it's like seven buildings. So we're really happy for a construction to be done. That was, that was very tiring. <laughs> So, PJ, I have one last question um, before I ask it. Where should we point people towards? Obviously, they can go to goatmilkstuff.com. Where else online or on your site should they check out? 
Well, I actually have a free bar of soap for your listeners. If wow. That's, if they would that's like amazing. Yeah. Thank so you. you mentioned the website is goatmilkstuff.com. Yeah. Yeah. And then they go slash inspired soap. And um, it's just one word. There's no space or hyphen or anything. It's just goatmilkstuff.com slash inspired soap. And it'll give them the directions. Wow. Goatmilkstuff.com slash inspired soap. That's very generous of you. Thank yeah. you. And so, you know, the website is where everything is pretty much based off from, from there. You get to our YouTube channel and our, and our Twitter and Facebook. And so, you know, we're on pretty much most yeah. of the social medias. We never do it as well as I would like. We, uh, we did a lot with videos for a while there. And then with this la- latest construction, we kind of had to put that on hold. So we're, we're, you have a good setup right now, yeah. right where you are. Yeah. Yep. So we're hoping to get back to that soon. So last question, PJ is, what should we leave people with? What have we not talked about that would be interesting? What, what else? One of the things that I, I talk to a lot of people about is there's a lot of um, cynicism out there that the American dream is dead, you know, that you really can't get ahead. And oh, I like to tell people that it's still out there. You know, we, we are living, breathing examples of that, that you can succeed. Uh, it's not necessarily going to be easy. It's going to take a lot of hard work. It's going to take a lot of late nights. But if you have a product that you believe in, you you can make it happen. You know, the Internet is a wonderful thing because for very, very inexpensively, you don't need to teach yourself how to code now. There's there's all sorts of do it yourself you know, websites out there. You can put something up and start taking money and start trying things seeing what sells, seeing what people um, are interested in. Right. One of the, the main benefits that we had from going to all those craft fairs was actually talking face-to-face with people, watching what they did. What drew their eye? What did they pick up and smell for the soap? You know, What were their reactions? What did they buy? How many did they buy? Why did they buy those? You know, how sensitive they, were they to discounts? All of those things that, you know, there's craft shows everywhere. There's farmer's markets everywhere. You know, you don't have to have a farm type product or whatnot. I mean, you can take your, you know, to a flea market and talk to some customers and, you know, for a $50 investment, see what people, you know, what they like and, and talk to them face to face. And so there's, there's a lot of really easy ways to test things. You don't necessarily have to build a, yeah. a store, you know, and, and invest in that. Um, so it, it is still possible. You yeah. know, everybody can still do it. You know, don't don't be afraid of setbacks. It's not always a smooth ride. You know, a lot of people don't share all their failures and setbacks, but we all have them. But it is still possible. Yeah, test small and and try it out. And dream big. Yeah. Yeah, dream big because a lot of people are afraid to do that, and and you can dream big. PJ, I want to be the first one. Thank you so much for your time amongst the business, the farm, the kids. Um, I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.